Hello, and welcome to a lecture on gameplay and levels. Now we are getting into the nitty, very gritty of designing a game. And this is where um, this, this unit is all about fun, about letting your players have fun. But this is where the game designer does not have fun. This is where it's not fun to design a game because gameplay and leveling systems require hours and hours and hours of work. And it requires just sitting in front of a spreadsheet and writing a bunch of math and running a bunch of simulations and checking your math over and over and over again, um, getting other people to play your game and having them come back and tell you, this was the most miserable experience I've ever had. And then you have to drop back and ask yourself, why was this so miserable for them? Um, so, uh, but if you get this right, you can make a really fun game. If you get it wrong, well, you gotta go back and tweak it. So let's talk about gameplay and how to do your level system. Uh, first of all, we go back to our handy dandy little chart here. Uh, you have the player and they input through the user interface, which we talked about last time. And that triggers some player events, which go back to the core mechanics. So we are now in the core mechanics. We will be in the core mechanics until this class is over. We are in the bottom right corner of this chart and how the core mechanics take the player events and make in-game events and report that back to the user interface um, and things like that. So right now, this week and next, in the next few weeks, we are talking about core mechanics, uh, the core mechanics of your game. Um, so um, next week, we're going to even be more nitty gritty when we actually write out the formulas of our game. But right now, um, we're talking just about the overall basic leveling system and the challenges uh, that a player uh, gets to do, that the game gives to the player. So we start with this Thomas Edison quote, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you don't know what perspiration is, it means sweating. It means being willing to put in the sweat work, which I just said is um, sitting in front of a computer with an Excel spreadsheet running a bunch of math. That's the perspiration and doing it for hours and hours and hours. Um, at the beginning of this class, we watched a YouTube video about how Mario Kart was made. The beginning of that and the end of that were really fun for the designers, but there's that wonderful note in the video where it said they just sat in a room all day and tried to figure out the real world mechanics of driving a, um, a uh, cart. Uh, you know, so a go-kart. And so that took a lot of work and they had to run several simulations in Excel um, and figure it out. And they had a lesser version of Excel than you have. Um, so let's get started with just a list of how to make games not fun. Uh, so here's how to make your game bomb totally. One is make stupid mistakes. Make uh, elementary mistakes, right? Um, so I could give you so many examples of games that have made elementary mistakes. Um, Final Fantasy 15, they, instead of treasure chests, they had little shiny blobs on the ground, and those blobs were incredibly hard to target. Final Fantasy 15 is a good game. I enjoyed playing it. I did not enjoy wandering around a shiny little blob trying to trigger the button that would pick it up. They just defined that trigger area just as way too small. Um, so it's elementary mistakes like that that can ruin your game. There's all kinds of YouTube videos of people jumping over um, these little uh, these little shiny blobs because <coughs> because the button to pick up something was the same button <coughs> to jump over something. I'm sorry. And so um, <coughs> another thing you could do wrong is release a rough draft, which means shortcut the tuning and polishing, shortcut the perspiration phase of your game. This has been very famous with PC games. Um, most games now were made for consoles, and because every single PlayStation, every single Nintendo Switch, every single Xbox comes out of the factory with the exact same specifications, it's actually pretty easy, um, and that's why we do consoles, is because it makes it easy on the designers. They have to design a game to run on one type of machine. The problem with PC games is every computer has different specifications. Every computer has a different screen size. Every computer has a different graphics card. Every type of computer has a different processor. Um, and so with PC games, a lot of companies will port, it's called making a port, they will port a game from PlayStation to PC, but they won't do the tuning and polishing work uh, to make that game run on every type of machine there is. And to be fair, that's a hard job. I mean, it's hard to get it right. But what that ends up doing is a lot of PC gamers will get really angry because they'll download a game to their PC and it just will not run. 
uh, because the game has only been designed to run on PlayStations. And so uh, so this has created a lot of rage and anger. And I am actually in the group. I'm, I'm a little bit of a PC gamer. Um, and so I have a Nintendo Switch, and then I play other games on PC that I want to play. Um, I as a rule, and most PC gamers as a rule, will not download a game on day one when it release. I'll wait a year because after a year, they've tuned and polished it because everybody's complained. The problem is in that year, all the PC gamers have flooded the um, stores and the uh, review websites with negative reviews of your game. And otherwise, it's a great game. Uh, Batman Arkham Knight was one of those games. Great game. Uh, but the PC version was buggy and it crashed all the time and very few computers could run it. Um, so uh, so everybody got really angry. And in fact, in that case, Warner Brothers had to refund everybody the price of the game. Um, and then it took them, oh, geez, a year to get all the bugs out. Um, it was a mess. So don't release your rough draft. Do the work. Um, what Warner Brothers should have done there is they should have released it on the PlayStation and the Game Boy, Game Boy, <laughs> uh, Xbox, there it is. Um, they should have done that and waited on the PC port, which a lot of companies are doing nowadays. The PC port will be months after the Xbox um, uh, version lands. So another way to make games not fun then is to make players do the same thing over and over again. And repeat, um, and repeat all the ideas from previous games. So, uh, no, you know, nobody likes to do the same thing over and over and over again. That's what makes games boring. It's like, oh, here we go. I have to do this thing again. I have to do this thing again. Um, so we'll talk about that on, on future slides. Um, and then just, you know, make your game a repeat of all the ideas from previous games. Don't have a, a reason for your game to exist. Every game should have a reason that it exists, and it should be a unique reason. Maybe you have a unique story you want to tell. Maybe you have a unique idea on an old play scheme. Uh, with the user interface, remember, we said don't repeat the wheel on the user interface. Shooting should be the same in every game. It should be the same button. Uh, you, the menu button should be the same in every game. You should have a menu in every game. Uh, you know, don't reinvent the wheel on the user interface, but when it comes to actually the gameplay itself, the, the challenges themselves, there should be some unique idea on the challenge. Um, so, with those four things in mind, here's how to make games fun. One is the gameplay comes first. Um, the gameplay comes first. Uh, the story doesn't come first. Uh, your awesome user interface and graphics don't come first. Uh, gameplay comes first. So if your game is not fun to actually play, then um, then nobody's going to play it, right? Uh, so, uh, so as much as we've talked about the story, as much as we've talked about user interfaces, anything else we've talked about before this is important, but not as important as actually making your game fun. If you and your design team are sitting in a staff room, conference room, playing your game and laughing hysterically, that's a really good sign that you've done it right. Um, I'm thinking about some of the games I'm playing right now. My kids love to watch them because we're having so much fun. That's the goal of a game, to have fun. So gameplay comes first. Uh, second thing is get a feature right or leave it out. If it's buggy and glitchy and it's not fun, just leave it out. Um, so many game designers. Um, this is true of like other things like writing or even a scene in a movie. If the scene in the movie is just a disaster, leave it out. Um, I'm a Saturday Night Live fan a little bit. I'm not always a fan of them, but sometimes when they get it right, they get it right. Um, every week, there's they, they have two or three skits that they cut out of their final broadcast just because the skit didn't work. They thought it was going to be funny. They wrote it well. They acted it well. And then they watched it and was like, wow. That was a mess. Let's not put that in there. Um, so they leave it out. Um, so same thing with writing. Uh, if you want to be a good writer, if a paragraph is awful, leave it out of your paper. Write another paragraph or just make your paper shorter, right? Um, same thing with making games. Um, if something is dumb and it's glitchy and you can't get it right and you're like, man, we really thought this would be a good idea, but all of us hate it, just leave it out. Just let it go. Uh, you know, there's that wonderful song, let it go, let it go, right? Uh, so let it go. Um, design with your player in mind. We've already talked about that quite a bit. I'm not going to beat that horse, but just, you know, uh, don't ask yourself what is fun for computer nerds to play. Ask yourself what is fun for the average everyday person to play. So we've already done all that work on who your player is and who your audience is and having a target audience and all that. Um, next is very important, abstract or automate the parts of your game that are not fun. So if there's a part of your game that's essential to gameplay, not like the second one up there, uh, but it's just not fun, um, then have the computer do it. 
have the computer do that part of the game so that the player isn't like bored to death doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so Stardew Valley is actually a great example of this. Uh, when you So the game starts, you have to water all your crops by hand. And that's fun uh, until a point. But eventually it violates the rule we talked about in the last slide, which I'll go to that side, is making the player do the same thing over and over again. So in Stardew Valley, uh, the second time around, they open up a feature where you can actually build sprinklers to water your plants. You, harvesting plants, you have to harvest your plants in that game, um, every plant by hand, but then eventually you can unlock a way for to hire employees, uh, little actually little like gnomes and stuff who will harvest your plants for you. Um, and so right about the time that game starts to get boring, then it unlocks something that's automated, that, that, that the game does it for you, the little uh, employees do it for you, um, and uh, or the sprinklers water it for you, right? Um, so, um, so do that. I'm going to have another example of that on the next slide. Uh, strive for harmony, elegance, and beauty. Um, strive for harmony, elegance, and beauty. Um, it should be fun and beautiful to cross your world. Um, it should be elegant. It should be beautiful, and it should be so fun. I think of Super Mario Odyssey, which came out on the Switch a few years ago. Um, there's a fast travel feature in that game, and every big game should have a fast travel feature. I, I've used it maybe four times in hundreds of hours of playing that game because it is so much fun to run across the maps of that game. Uh, Mario is just a, such a fun avatar, his triple jumps and his long jumps. Uh, and, and in that game, he can throw his hat and bounce off his hat. Oh my, oh, it's so much fun. It's harmonious. It's elegant. The maps are beautiful. I also think of uh, Zelda. Um, you know, I've used the fashion travel in Zelda all the time, and yet uh, the game is still just so beautiful. The music is so beautiful. And, you know, so strive for it. You may not hit it. It's okay. Not every game hits it, but the games that do are awesome. And then be imaginative. Use your imagination. Um, going back to nobody likes to do the same thing over and over and over again. So you should have your core challenge, but then just use your imagination. Uh, and think, how else? How can we build puzzles with our core mechanics and, and make every puzzle different? Make every puzzle doing something different. Um, once again, Zelda Breath of the Wild is a great example of this. 120 uh, shrines in that game, with all with puzzles you have to unlock. Some of them, the puzzle is getting to the shrine. Uh, others, the, the puzzles are in the shrine, but all of them are different. I never did the same shrine twice. Never, none of those shrines felt different. Um, there are 120 of them, and they use the basic mechanics of the game to make them fun. Um, so be imaginative when you vary the challenges. Here's a couple examples of, one is abstracting and automating. Here's Final Fantasy VI again. You guys are probably getting tired of examples from this game. This is a game that hit harmony, elegance, and beauty, by the way. Play it, play it, play it. Uh, it's one of my, it's my favorite game. But notice at the very top of the screen, above the, the finger pointing arrow, uh, there's a button there called Optimize. Um, choosing weapons and armor, some people love doing that. Some people love the strategy of it. Most of us don't, and I'm one that doesn't like choosing weapons. I do not want to spend hours of my game choosing what weapons my players are going to carry around. So they created an optimize button, and I just click that button, and it just puts on the best stuff. I don't have to scroll through all the menus to find the best stuff. I just click optimize, and it's a half a second thing, and then I go to the next player and hit optimize, and then that makes sure everybody has the same, has the best equipment that I have available equipped. Um, there is still a little bit of strategy in that because the order you optimize the characters gets to decide who gets the really best stuff and so right now i only have one ragnarok sword it's on terra um but um but if i wanted one of the other players like Locke, to have the ragnarok sword i would have to I'd have to optimize him first, then move to her. So there's still some good strategy in it. It's still fun to figure out, okay, who do I want to have the Ragnarok sword? But I don't have to scroll through all the menus figuring out. I just click optimize. That's an example of automating a part of your game that's not fun. Um, and so, and then this is going back to uh, be imaginative when you vary your challenges. And so uh, Arkham, the Arkham series um, has a really fun combat idea. It's been used in a lot of games now. It's uh, rhythmic which is really cool, so I can I, I could do rhythm, and I, I have to hit the button in a rhythm, or else I miss, and our uh, uh, counter resets, um, and so I can either hit, or I can dodge, or I can throw 
a batarang, or I can back claw someone to me in the first game. And so in the first game, I can jump around and hitting, and then I can dodge. And it's kind of like um, a Guitar Hero. I have to hit it in a rhythm. If I miss the rhythm, then my hits aren't as powerful. Um, so then in Arkham City, they actually added to it, and now I can flip over enemies, now I can stun them, now I can summon bats to sort of uh, swarm around them, now I can tase them, um, now I can uh, beat them down and hit them a bunch of times. And the enemies, right? They Every game, I could do the other two games there in this series, um, at the beginning you just had three types of enemies, regular enemies, armored enemies, and armed enemies, right? But then in the next game, it's the same mechanics, you still have to jump around and hit buttons in a rhythm, but now I can, now enemies can taser me. They have tasers. Now there's ninjas that dodge my hits, and I have to uh, move with their dodge. Now I have extra large enemies, and have, there's all kinds of uh, button combinations. They take down the extra large enemies, and then there's um, extra large armored enemies, and there's extra large armed enemies, and, and now there's all kinds of combinations. That's just a fun example how the Arkham series um, had the exact same mechanic. You're still just jumping around, dodging, flipping, hitting, and things like that, yet every game added more and more to it, which is really fun. Um, and so they were really imaginative when they buried the challenges, which is the last one here. They were so imaginative. Uh, same challenge, but then they buried it so much that every single new fight was a fun fight. No fights felt the same. Um, and some of those fights I enjoy so much, I go back and just replay them over and over again, uh, which is cool. And so those are ways to make your game fun. Optimize the parts that, that aren't fun, and then be imaginative and vary the parts that are fun. Just keep reinventing your combat. Keep reinventing your, your challenges. Um, so make your game fun. That's what I'm saying. Um, so with that said, now let's get into the nitty-gritty I talked about earlier. Now let's get into... Okay, how are we actually going to make our challenges? How are we actually going to go about designing our gameplay? Um, the first thing is obviously having an hierarchy of challenges. That's the progression of difficulty in your game. Every game should get harder and harder and force the player to adapt and adapt as they play it. Or else you're going to fall into that trap of the players just doing the same thing over and over and over again, which gets boring. So the thing you need to know is every single game still has levels. Some, in fact, I would argue most now, are just hidden. Uh, some, the hierarchy of challenges is hidden from the player, but every game still has a leveling system. Every game still runs like Super Mario Brothers, where you beat one level, and the next level gets a little harder, and the next level gets a little harder, and the next gets a little bit harder. And every game should have levels. Every game should get harder and harder, or else it will just get more and more boring. And so every game, your game should get harder and harder. So when you design the gameplay, you want to sit down with a flow chart in mind, which is one of your assignments, by the way, and map out how your game is going to get harder and harder. Um, so map out how your game is. So here are some ways that different games do levels. So here are some ways that you can do your hierarchy of challenges. Uh, one is just like Tetris. In Tetris, old game, the blocks sped up every 10 or so blocks. So every 10 or so times that a block came down the screen, the game would get faster, um, which was so much fun. So Tetris, the, the Iron of Challenges was just built into each game play, and eventually the blocks would be going so fast you couldn't keep up and you'd game over. Um, and so that was an Iron of Challenges. The blocks just got faster. Very simple one. Um, so it starts out really slow, and then every 10 or so blocks that fell... Um, they'd get faster, 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 faster until it was too fast. That's what made it fun, by the way. We're going to talk about that on a later slide. In Mar uh, Super Mario, every level, uh, Super Mario actually has levels, right? You know that every level has a few more enemies, a few more pits for Mario to fall in. Uh, the enemies themselves, uh, they trick and improve. Some enemies you don't even see till later on in the game, and they sort of have a trick that makes them, uh, makes them harder to beat and get past. Later levels, Mario moves slower in water, so there's water levels that slow him way down, but the enemies still move really fast. Or Mario moves so fast on ice, you can't stop him. So, uh, so he, you know, he'll slide right off the map unless you jump the other way. Um, so that's how Mario did levels. Every, every level gets a little bit harder, a little bit more enemies. The enemies themselves get harder. Um, then you add ice and water uh, challenges. You have boss fights, and every boss fight gets harder. You know how Mario works. Um, so then uh, we move out of Mario, and we go to Arkham City, which I talked about earlier. Um, Arkham City, uh, certain story moments unlock harder enemies on the main map. So the main map is an open map. You can go anywhere right from the beginning of the game, um, but when you defeat a part of the story, 
then you come back out to the main map and the enemies have gotten harder. Maybe they've gotten armed or maybe they've picked up armor. And oftentimes that fits back into the story. Like you have Joker over the loudspeaker being like, I just found a cache of guns, Batman. Well, you were fighting the penguin and now all my guys have guns. Ha ha ha. We'll try to get past them now, which by the way is a great example of the game, like, uh, you know, taunting you, which I love, right? Joker is so great in those games. Um, so now, uh, I have to cross the map without getting shot at, whereas before I could cross the map and there were just random thugs, enemies down on the, the ground, right? Um, so that's how Arkham City did it. I would, as the story progressed, the enemies got harder. Um, then you have Skyrim, uh, which a lot of games use Skyrim system now, whereas the enemies just level up when the player does. And so when you start the game, the all the bad guys in the game are roughly the same level as the player and roughly have the same weapons that the player has. As the player gets more and more levels as the player levels up than the enemies do too and so uh so skyrim the game gets harder just because the player gets harder the player gets tougher the enemies get harder so that's one way of doing it um uh zelda breath of the wild used a very similar system to that um so and they they yeah they sort of melded arkham cities to skyrims is what they did um, then you have Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, certain parts of the map have higher difficulty than others. And so you have a map and they um, section off. Um, it, you know, you can go anywhere on the map. And yet there's some places where if you go there at a low level, the enemies will one shot you. Um, and so, um, so you have to wait to explore, to really explore a map until you are a certain level. Some have criticized that and said you're basically making a, a linear game. Um, which is true, and yet Assassin's Creed Origins is still a bunch of fun. And sometimes it's fun to go in those parts of the map that have the higher difficulties and see if you can't sneak through them, uh, see if you can't unlock certain things. Um, but you can't fight anybody because you will get one shot, um, and uh, and it's not worth your time. And so, uh, so those are different ways of doing archive challenges. You see the creativity there. I could uh, list more, but those are the five main ways that we do it. One is to actually have levels and every level gets harder. Uh, Tetris, you know, the box speed up. Um, and then you have your open world games where, um, but, uh, and then you have different ways of making it harder and harder as you go along in your open world games like Arkham City, Skyrim, and Assassin's Creed. Um, so, um, so yeah, have an hierarchy of challenges. Be creative with it. How is the game going to get harder as the player goes through it? Um, and so, so then after you've defined your hierarchy, then you need to start to define your challenges. Remember, every game is a dare. Every game says, I dare you um, to, you know, like the Joker saying, I dare you now, Batman, to get to where I am because I've given all my, my goons guns. Now they're going to shoot at you, not just punch at you, right? So now good luck, you know? So every game should dare the player. Um, and so there are two types of challenges. You need to know these. Um, one is explicit, which is telling the player what to do. So explicit challenges is the Joker says, come find me and get past all my goons with guns. That's an explicit challenge. Tells the player exactly what to do. Tetris tells you exactly what to do. Clear as many blocks by making as many lines with them as you can, right? Uh, Mario, very explicit challenge, right? Get to the end of this level. Jump, dodge, uh, take out enemies, get mushrooms, you know. Uh, but get to the end of the level to save the princess. Then you have implicit challenges, which is don't tell the player what to do. Let the player figure it out. Um, a lot of games now are more implicit, and that's more fun. Um, so let the player figure it out. Let the player um, figure out what to do. Zelda Breath of the Wild. Um, game opens up, and you have no idea what to do. And they just launch out into an open world, and it's up to you to figure it out. Now, there are explicit challenges in that game. Eventually, it does tell you what to do, but implicit is have fun. Wander around. You know, Let the player figure out where they're supposed to go, what they're supposed to do. Um, and then you have varied implicit challenges, um, which is actually where most modern games are, which is where uh, not only do you not tell the player exactly what to do, uh, but you offer many ways to win. And so implicit challenges, they have to figure out the one way to win. A varied implicit challenge is offer many ways to win uh, and reward the player's critical thinking and creative energy skills. Give them 18 options for beating the game and let them choose. Um, a note there. Um, most games are explicit at the beginning and move to more implicit and more implicit varied later on. Um, so most games have a tutorial level where it says do this. Um, and so, but then later on, it's more implied. Um, and another note is uh, with varied, you have to be very careful there. This is where the perspiration comes in. Um, you have to offer many, um, the, if you offer too many ways, the game's too easy. 
and it's and people just so um, example that's Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, they offered way too many ways to win, and right from the beginning of the game, you could get some tools and some things that would max your characters out and make the game cakewalk and really boring. Um, so if you offer too many ways and varied, the game's going to fall apart on you, and so you have to be very careful there. And yet most players want a variety of ways to beat a game. Most players want a way uh, to get through the game. So, um, so with that said, uh, so make your hierarchy of challenges, and then, um, and then define it a, by what are we going to tell a player to do, what are we not going to tell a player to do, what challenges are going to have many ways, and then you use that to create what's called your atomic challenges, which very simply speaking, atomic challenges are the core challenges of your game. They're the things the player has to do to progress and win the game. So what challenges are um, are just integral to the game? What are they actually trying to accomplish? Um, so you have to define those. You have to write those down. What is it that my player has to do in order to progress in this game? Um, and so one uh, giving them one atomic challenge at a time is basically what like Mario does or what Tetris does, and that's more basic, but it's also less fun. Uh, it works for some games, but now um, you want to figure out ways to have simultaneous atomic challenges. Those are a lot more fun. And so atomic challenges is what the player has to do to win. Um, and so throwing 10 of them at once is more fun, where they have to do 10 things at the same time and, and navigate all that and figure all that out. Here's an example of the simultaneous atomic challenge. Uh, this is a mini game uh, called uh, something uh, Desert of the Prairie King. The player's in the middle, and each one of those enemies coming at him, and he's about to lose, by the way, uh, each one of those enemies coming at him uh, is its own atomic challenge. So in order to win this game, the player has to dodge the aliens and um, win the game. Uh, dodge the aliens while shooting at them. So those are two atomic challenges of themselves, dodge and shoot. Those are two simultaneous atomic challenges. However, each enemy is itself an atomic challenge. He has to, he has to eliminate each one uh, that is coming at him and survive until the timer at the top of the screen reaches zero, that little timer bar up there. Um, and so uh, so there's literally 100 atomic challenges on this screen right now. I, well, I don't know. You can count them. Uh, but there's a lot of atomic challenges. He has to dodge all of these and shoot at all of these and in a way, in an order that eliminates them before they eliminate him. Um, so that's an example of atomic challenges. Wipe them all out, but there's several of them. And so there's several atomic challenges right here. And he cannot progress. He cannot win the game or she cannot win the game until um, they are all taken out. So that's an example of simultaneous atomic challenges. Tetris just has one atomic challenge at a time, and that is the falling block. Um, what to do with the falling blocks. So Tetris just has one, uh, whereas this game has several, even though it's, they're still both two-dimensional games. So when you design your atomic challenges, when you're thinking about what are the main challenges that are going to progress my game, there's three things you need to think about, and that's going to define the types of challenges in your game. First is you need to think about the player's intrinsic skill. That is the amount of natural talent needed to do something if they're given unlimited time. So, um, so if I give you unlimited time, um, can you throw a piece of paper across the room and land it in the trash can across the room? You probably can. Some people will hit it on the first try. Some people like me will take about 30 tries, but I'll get it. Um, that's intrinsic skill, though. Um, the reason why intrinsic skill is important is um, if you give me enough time, um, could I figure out a way to jump off the roof of Leighton Christian Academy and land it so I don't break any bones? The answer to that question is no, uh, because if I break a bone on the first try, I'm done. And so intrinsic skill, it means you want the player to be able to do your challenge. It's not fun when I dare you to do something that you can't do. Right now, I could say, oh, I dare you to jump up to the moon. I dare you to jump from where you're at right now and get on top of that moon without anything else than your physical strength. There's no way you're going to do that. Um, so um, intrinsic skill means your player has to be able to actually do what you're challenging them to do. Um, it might be too hard. Um, and then the next uh, factor we have to think about then is stress, which is the ability to put up with the challenges coming at you fast, right? So stress, we're actually adding a time. It's now, uh, can you do it with the time, with the time frame? And can the player handle the stress? Uh, so Tetris 
is, yeah, anybody can line up those blocks if they're moving really slow to clear all the lines. But Tetris adds stress. And so anybody can do the game, but now when I speed up the blocks, now I'm adding a stress ability. Can the player deal with the stress and deal with the calculations they have to do in their head? Um, and then there's an absolute difficulty, which means the stress and intrinsic skill. So every challenge in your game should have an absolute difficulty. Um, so, which means that this is how hard this game is. And it's, can they do it? Can they actually do what I'm telling them to do? And can they do it in the time allotted? Um, and so how, how much am I going to stress them out and uh, how hard is it going to be to do what I have them do? Um, so, um, so you need to design with these three in mind. Can the player actually do it? How much will it stress them out? Add the two together and that's the absolute difficulty. So now that we've defined that, let's talk about the types of challenges video games have. And there's a lot. Uh, there should be another worksheet associated with this or handout associated with this video that actually has these listed all out on one page. Make sure you check that out. Uh, these are just types of challenges. Every game now has at least from one, one from each category. I think all, yeah, so all your games should. So physical coordination challenges are like uh, Guitar Hero. Um, I'm trying to think of other video games, you know. Um, so kind of like Mario, uh, you know, Mario speedruns. Uh, tempo run games or physical coordination, so it's just speed and reaction challenges. Accuracy and precision, can I hit a target? Can I shoot at something, hit a target? Most of your first person shooters have an accuracy and precision challenge. Uh, manipulating physics, I think of the game Portal, really great game where you manipulate the physics. Uh, there's also some really cool challenges in Zelda where you're manipulating physics. Timing and rhythm, that's Guitar Hero. Uh, Guitar Hero speed and reaction timing and rhythm challenges. And then combination moves where you're just following along, that's also Guitar Hero. So yeah, physical coordination, think Guitar Hero. Uh, think Dance Dance Revolution, if you guys even play that game anymore. A lot of first person shooters will have some of that, your Temple Run games. Uh, then you have logic and math. Um, you know, racing actually fits in logic and math because you're actually, uh, well, racing games too are, oh, sorry, I, I got confused. Racing just means you're trying to do math very quickly. Typing games, you go to typing.com. Typing games are all, uh, you know, racing games. Trivia games, uh, memory and pattern recognition, that's where uh, you have to remember a pattern. Uh, formal logic puzzles, once again, Zelda has a bunch of those. Um, also, Sudoku is a formal logic puzzle. Uh, game. i um, trying to think. There's plenty of like logic and math. Then you have exploration challenges, uh, being aware of the space around you, trying to get past the locked door. Locked door is not just an actual locked door in a game, but actually a metaphor. It's kind of thinking of the escape room challenges. Traps, falling in a trap, trying to get out. Mazes or exploration challenges. Uh, mazes with teleporters. I hate those challenges. They drive me crazy. I have spatial awareness, but I don't have that much spatial awareness. Uh, hiding objects and you have to find them. Actually, one of my favorite like just passive games to do is where they show you a picture of a thousand items and you and then they give you a list of ones you have to find i think those ones are fun they're they're good to waste five minutes of your time then you have conflict challenges think your real-time strategy game so strategy uh tactics is different than strategy strategy is coming up with an overall way to win tactics is uh controlling a certain group and um and sort of the micro so strategy is more macro tactics are more micro uh, controlling a certain group or a certain supply line to a group. Uh, you have logistics, uh, which is figuring out the supply lines, kind of overlaps with tactics there. You have survival games where, you know, like tower defense games or survival games, you build towers and hordes and hordes come at you and you just have to survive until they stop coming. Uh, defensive games where you're defending. Uh, tower defense games are also a little bit defensive. You're defending something. There's a vulnerable unit. You have to keep them alive. Um, then you have stealth where you have to pass through a map of enemies without being seen. Um, so by the way, these aren't types of games. These are just types of challenges in a game. One game might have a um, have all of these challenges, right? I think um, I talked earlier about Breath of the Wild has 120 shrines, and at least one of these is represented in every shrine, uh, which is crazy. And then you have economic challenges, which you can accumulate resources, and whoever gets the most resources wins. Uh, balancing an economy, where you have the same amount coming in as going out. A lot of real-time strategies, you're not wanting to accumulate a bunch of resources other than maybe troops. You're balancing making sure you're spending all the money that's coming in. So you're both getting money in, but you're making sure you're spending it going out or else you're going to lose, right? Um, or else you're just gonna, the enemy's going to be you. Um, caring for living things, that's farm games and things like that, where you actually have to feed and clothe and um, do things like that. Sounds a lot like parenting, by the way. <laughs> a lot like 
might be your teacher too. Um, so that's a challenge of the game. Then you have two other groups, conceptual reasoning and lateral thinking um, that uh, requires you to come up with concepts. Conceptual reasoning is what it takes to write a research paper. Not a very fun game, but you can work it into a game. Uh, lateral thinking is more applying something from one area to another area. And so those two are more mixing everything together. Um, so when it comes to the actual challenges of your game, it's important to look at this list and, and identify the ones that are going to come into your game. Then after you've done that, um, after you've defined your challenges, after you've made a list of everything, that the uh, all the dares that you're going to give to your player, then you use that to define your actions. And your actions are what the player does. It's the verbs of your game. Um, so uh, what is the player actually doing? Are they punching? Are they kicking? Are they hiding? Are they... Um, building? Are they destroying? Are they um, shooting? What are So what is the player actually doing? And there are certain types of actions. Uh, one is your atomic actions, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. Uh, but then you also have unstructured actions, just like looking around. Um, an unstructured action, um, I need to look around to um, to, uh, do the to uh, do the atomic challenge. And yet it's still unstructured. I can look around wherever I want to look around. I can go wherever I want to go. Um, so you have unstructured actions that don't map one-to-one -to, -one to your atomic actions. Atomic actions are they need this to, to beat the game. Unstructured actions are we're just being nice and giving them a few other things they can do that will help them beat the game. Then you have creation challenge, uh, actions, meaning like designing an avatar or building a car. Um, so maybe you don't need, you know, it doesn't really matter what your avatar looks like to beat the game. It has nothing to do with atomic actions, but it does make the game more fun for some people. Then you have socialization actions, like talking to um, non-player characters. Um, so, you know, in uh, all the old RPGs, you walk into a town, there's at least five in each town, five NPCs, that you don't have to talk to them. Um, and talking to them doesn't do anything for the game. It doesn't, um, you know, they're not atomic actions. You don't have to talk to them. And yet talking to them is still kind of fun. And they can actually provide some background on the city. And, and sometimes they tell a joke that's kind of funny. And you're like, ha ha. But, you know, so the, those are socialization actions. And you have story actions like interactive dialogue. Um, so like, you know, story actions are, uh, you know, you don't need to choose one or the other to win the game and yet it just helps the player feel like they have more agency feels like they have more choice they can say oh that's cool or they can say huh nah whatever you know and so yeah that just those are story actions then you have software actions which are hugely important like pausing the game fast forwarding the game a lot of games now are coming with the fast forward button which makes things really fun um changing the buttons changing the control scheme uh even changing the elements of the user interface uh where the windows are those aren't gonna you know those aren't key to winning the game. Um, those have nothing to do with your atomic actions at the top of that list, but they help make the experience more cohesive, more harmonious, elegant, and beautiful for the player. Um, so then once you've defined your actions, now here are the steps to designing your actions. Start with your atomic challenges. So what does the player absolutely have to do to beat this game? Um, so, and then ask yourself, what do they need to do to solve that challenge? So make a list of your atomic challenges. And then right out that in order to solve this challenge, they're going to need to move an object. They're going to need to be able to pick up a key and use a key. They're going to need to be able to punch. They're going to be able to shoot. So then you have to define that. How are they going to be able to do that? So make a list of those. That's step three. And then assign them to the button scheme on your controller. Uh, you know, and then how are you going to tell them that that button does that? Maybe, you know, what are your feedback elements? This goes back to user interface. And then move to the higher level. So and repeat. So um, if, if things are going to get really tough at the later levels, then you, you're you going to have to make a list of even more actions that they're going to need to do. Um, and then define the other types. Then go back to the previous slide. After you, the, the first four or five steps there are just your atomic challenges. Then go back and say, okay, how are they going to pause the game? Uh, how are they going to talk to non-playable characters? How are they going to... Um, fast forward the game. I mean, how are they going to create and design the avatar? What do they need? So, um, so write down your actions, then define them to your controller. And then of course, save the game, give them a way to save the game. Uh, there, here are some ways to save the game. Um, by the way, give them a way to save the game. <laughs> I want to say that again. Give them a way to save the game. Uh, the old way of doing saving the game was every level had a password. So when you got to a new level, you just wrote down the password. That's outdated. Some games still use that, and it's still kind of fun. Uh, but now you can actually Google and find all those passwords, which means you could just jump to level 10, which isn't necessarily bad at all. Um, 
just gives the player some choice. But anyway, password systems are outdated, but that was just the way that we did it back in the day. A few games have still tried to bring it back just for the nostalgia, but, you know, um, another way to save the game is give the player the option to interrupt the gameplay at certain points of the game or even all throughout to save, uh, that, you know. So that means the player can open up a menu and there's a save button there and they say save. Um, so that was another, that's also a little bit outdated. Um, it's really kind of fun, but also not. Um, so I'm told in the game Witcher 3 that the uh, player has to interrupt to save there and the, the player forgets all the time. And so a lot of players have lost 40 minutes of gameplay just because they never opened up the menu to save. Um, another option is a quick save button. That's a lot easier, where at any point in the game, you could just click a button and it will automatically save your game, and it doesn't interrupt the gameplay. The player's not interrupting anything. They just hit the button. But the most common today is just an automatic save system. Every time the player goes to a new city, in Skyrim, it's every time the player opens the menu. Um, any time that there's a story cutscene, it saves right after. Um, so, um, so automatic saves are probably the most common and the best. Um, sometimes it's fun because I'll game over and I'll be like, huh, I don't know where the game's going to put me. Um, so, um, so yeah, so give them an option to save their game. Um, do it automatically for them. Uh, saving your game is tedious and annoying. It's one of those things that's best if you just automate it for them. So that's just an example of that first site. So this has been a long lecture, uh, but it's one of the most important. I'd encourage you to look through it as you answer the questions this week. Let me know if you have questions. Thanks.